Thanks for listening to the AZ Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Mike Luke, joined by Jason Shear. Jason, we appreciate you uh, working with us. You, uh, you're you a man of many seasons. You are the man, Jason Shear. We appreciate you. You're, whatever you need, Michael. I'm here That's for That's what we're here for. All right, we've got a lot to get to. We're going to talk a lot of Arizona basketball. All I want to do is this. This has been a pet peeve of mine with this writer for a very long time. Ben Bulch has issued an apology saying that he used bad words, bad alliterations. Here's my problem with Ben Bulch from the LA Times. This guy has been making fun, sending little sending little code shots at Tucson for the longest time that we all know what they mean. Sure, I was stunned that he was able to get away with that first event, and I'm also stunned that He's never been called to account for anything, really. It's really, to me, wild in the year 2024. You no, know, I, I met Ben. I sat next to him in Salt Lake City. Uh, we, we talked a little bit. He seemed like a nice enough guy. I think he obviously screwed up, right? Like, I mean, there's no excuse for it. I think one part that's not getting enough attention is how does that make it through the LA Times editorial process? So, so I asked our buddy Tony Gimino about this. And um, ben, obviously, Tony's been – you actually like Tony. This is correct. Um, yes. And he said, and obviously copy editors are the, uh, they're the first people to go, obviously, but that still doesn't make answer to me that how that did not, how did whoever the copy editor is be like, uh, yeah, no, this isn't good. I mean, even if there's one copy editor, my dog, I don't understand how that went through and he was rightfully roasted for it. I just, I just don't understand how you go into an article thinking about writing something like that. It just absolutely, it baffles me to be honest with you. It's interesting because the Kim Mulkey said it was sexist. And then uh, Van Lith, the white guard on LSU, said it was racist. And the fact that you could make an argument that it's both, yeah. it means that it, it probably shouldn't have gotten written. Uh, yeah, that's what uh, we will leave it at that. But again, I you can uh, take that. Uh, I also like, too, about how he said the L.A. Times didn't ask him to uh, issue this, that he felt he had to issue it himself. That, to me, is even more uh, condemning if they didn't if they're like, nah, dude, don't worry about it. And he's like, oh, I got to do this myself. To me, that's a clear shot at the L.A. Times, right? Like, you, they didn't want me to even apologize. They told me probably to ignore it, and it would move on eventually. Uh, all right. Well, either way, we got that out of the way. Uh, now, we got a lot to get to here. Uh for, unfortunately, Arizona has lost Philly B and uh, Paulius Morauskas. We knew this was going to happen. I was hoping that other, you know, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe Philly B would meet with the uh, powers that be, pardon the pun, and there would be a, a little bit of a decision. But here's what this comes down to with Paulius Morauskas and uh, Philly B. These dudes were not going to be big time contributors next year at the U of A. You're going into the Big 12. This is far from the last movement that is going to happen. Both of these guys, I think you applaud them for their services, good practice players. But Tommy Lloyd is also at the stage now where he needs guys that can come in and they can come in and they can play immediately because next year is about to be a totally different animal. You can get away with seven guys in the, the WCC. You can get away with seven guys in the Pac-12. You cannot get away with seven guys in the Big 12. And I think the coaching staff realizes like, hey, we had, I don't want to call them dead away, but they're like, let's just call them dead scholarships, right? Mm -hmm. Like we had five dead scholarships last year. Right. That is just way too many. Going into the Big 12, you cannot have that happen. So now it's like, look, you're not going to play to Philly. You're not going to play much to Morauskas. They want to play. They have every right to want to play more. But, hey, we can't just fill those scholarships with more dudes who are barely going to play. Like we need guys that could give us 10 minutes, just 10 minutes that you could trust. You know, you, Morauskas and Philly B – both couldn't play more than five minutes without Tommy being like, oh, no, I can't do this. And especially, too, when you're going into a totally different conference. Now, the other thing I'm going to say is this is probably going to be far from the last movements because when you look at this roster, and again, I'm not saying anything that – this is just me purely speculating, but you watch these, uh, you look at some of the players on this roster right now, uh, Paulius Morauskas, Philly B, probably not going to be able to contribute next year. Conrad Martinez, 
probably not going to be able to contribute. I'm not saying Conrad's leaving. That's not at all what I'm saying. But you look at the players on the roster and you start to figure out, okay, who could be that net? Who could be able to help Arizona in the Big 12? Who couldn't? And then you start going backwards from there. These were two guys that obviously were probably not going to be able to help next year. And you also got to think like, like right now I would say Conrad is 50-50, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say Arizona brings in another guard. If you're Conrad, you got to kind of say, oh, you know, maybe I'm not playing. And then later on, like it it is a different transfer portal situation. It's 45 days instead of 60. There's a dead period that pops up on Thursday. Um, So we're going to see a lot of movement nationally. That's why you saw a lot of movement nationally today. But yeah, I mean, you just got to figure out like, like everyone has a soft spot for Philly B and Morauskas, and I totally get it. Especially but, Philly B. But but all I'll say is this: like, ask yourself, who can they guard on Baylor? They can't. Right. So right. who are they well, guarding in Houston? They can't. So well, they let's talk. Move. Let's talk Conrad because Conrad to me is the next one. And again, I have no inside information on Conrad. This is just me uh, speculating. But Arizona under I just don't see any situation where uh, Arizona is going to be able to go into next year. Because Conrad is not going to be able to play either way. Because if you bring back, uh, let's say you bring you bring in a veteran guard, he's going to play over Conrad. And Arizona is not going into next year. I can say this with a very uh, good authority that Arizona is not going into uh, next year with Conrad Martinez as your backup point guard. They're just not. Yeah, and and, and here's the thing too. Like Tommy's very unique in this day and age. It, it used to not be unique, but now it is. He believes in developing players, right? Like he redshirted Dylan. He redshirted Henry and said, I'm going to develop you. He wants to redshirt Conrad, but Conrad also wants to play. So when you're, and again, this is just, you know, hypothetical, whatever. If you're Conrad, you have to say to yourself, okay, am I willing to not play another year to be able to play as a junior? Or do I want to go to Santa Clara and play a little more, right? Right. These are the decisions that, like a dumb ball didn't want to wait another year. He could have, I think Arizona would have kept them, but he said, look, I'm good enough to go play at Santa Clara. I'm going to go do right. it. Yeah. Right. And maybe, and maybe Conrad says the same thing. Morauskas is probably saying the same thing and I'm going to go elsewhere and I'm going to play. And I appreciate Tommy for wanting to develop me, but that's just in this day and age, it's really hard to do. I also like it too, from a, a Tommy perspective that we're also at the stage where it's all right, we got to get players. This thing's about to change here and Arizona. And you and I joked about this uh, off record quite a bit, but Arizona has a lot. Arizona had felt I'm fine with having like one development guy, but it felt like Arizona had like three or four developmental guys that were probably never really going to play. Um, that to me is a little bit too much. And I think the Tommy gun kind of figured that one out. Um, and sure. I'm smiling because your boy went in the portal, and I, I want to know if you can get this done the second time around. Who? Nate Calmese is officially back in the portal. Bring in Nate Calmese. Hey, joking aside, would you rather have Nate Calmese or Conrad? I would probably take. I would take Nate. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Nate Calmese back in the uh, back in the portal. <laughs> by the way. All right, we're gonna get to Henry and all of them. Henry, we imagine will be back. Jason. Sure. Yeah. I believe Henry will come back. I, look, he loves college. Tommy loves him. Tommy loves Conrad too. That's why it's not a lock. These guys go. You redshirted Henry for a reason. If same thing with Dylan, if you thought they were bad, you don't redshirt them. You just run them off. Right. Right. And so I don't necessarily think Henry's very good. Um, but clearly Tommy's saying to himself, look, he redshirted, give him one more year. Let's bring him back. If he's not good, he's gone. But if he's our 10th guy, is it really that big of a deal? And on top of that, too, if you're going to miss, you want to miss with height. You want to miss with length. You want to miss with somebody that can block shots. Henry can do a lot of those things. So, again, I I listen, I don't think I don't think Henry's very good. But at the, at the same stage, I at least understand there is more of it. And again, I really like Philly B. Philly B to me is everything that is right with college basketball. But let's be honest here. As our joking aside, Philly, our, our joking aside with Conrad and Philly B, Philly B was never going to play at Arizona. And Conrad's probably not going to really play at Arizona either. Henry Vasar is a seven foot guy that can block shots. If he, you know, there's, a, there's an upside that he could potentially possess that those dudes don't possess here. Arizona could absolutely see Henry as the backup for it next year. It really right. wouldn't surprise me. And, and you know, he's tall. He can shoot the ball a little bit. His biggest issue is confidence, and it is a very large issue. But maybe the year off helps. You try to build it up. Um, and if it happens, it happens. And if not, hey, you miss on a seven-footer with some sort of potential, and you move on next year. 
All right. I was asked, why is Henry not good in your eyes? A variety of reasons. Uh, offensive- I think he's soft, to be honest. It's a yeah. hard, it's a bad word. I probably should have said it like that. But it, he it is. I mean, he he doesn't like physicality very much. He gets really down on himself. And, and um, let's be honest here. Our, our Joe, no, and Anderson, Dylan Anderson, Hoop Dreams is Dylan Anderson. Anderson Pats, uh, and I'll, I'll help you out here, Mike. Anderson did pass Henry early in the season. In the By a day. good margin, too. He just did. He did. And Dylan also has some, Dylan also has some, Dylan can be a stretch for as weird as that is to say on. I love putting that. You and I watched him sheer when he was I looking right at you. It's okay. But here's the issue with it. He cannot guard force. You are what you can guard. It's like Morauskas, right? Like Morauskas came in and Arizona played him at the three. As soon as they moved Morauskas to the three, I knew it was over. Right. He, because yeah. he can't guard threes. I just don't see Dylan guarding the four in the big 12. Right. I would agree with that. Now, real quick, and then we're going to get to uh, some other news, what Arizona is going to be looking for going forward. But sure, have you bet at the BetMGM Sportsbook app recently? Uh, yes, actually. Uh, Brielle put in an illegal bet. Oh, yeah. that's, well, that's what we like to hear. Yeah, that's on women's basketball tonight. There we go. We go. There we go. All right. Now, sign up for BetMGM. Use bonus code PHNX. Place your first BetMGM Sportsbook wager through BetMGM Sportsbook mobile app for at least $10. You'll receive up to 1,500 bonus bets if the bet loses. Check out the show notes for details. Again, you got all kinds of stuff. Women's basketball coming up here. And now let's hear from the great Shane Diefenbach with a disclaimer. Those bets expire in seven days. One new customer offer only. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Available in the U.S. Call 877-8-HOPE-NY-467-369-NEW-YORK. Four six seven three six nine New York. Call 1-800-327-5050, Massachusetts. 21 plus only. Please gamble responsibly. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP, Arizona. 1-800-BETS-OFF, Iowa. 1-800-981-0023, Puerto Rico. First bet offer for new customers only. Subject to eligibility requirements. Bonus bets are non-withdrawable. In partnership with Kansas Crossing Casino and Hotel. See BetMGM.com for terms. U.S. promotional offers not available in New York, Nevada, North Carolina, Ontario, or Puerto Rico. All right, there's that. And then one other thing, game time, my friend. Let's say you're like not like Jason Shear myself and you're a cool person, but you are cooler than us. And you're like, man, where can I go sit ahead of those dweebs because I deserve to hit a set of them? Uh, game time, check it out. Game time, all kinds of really good stuff. Now, here's the deal. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code PHNX for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code PHNX for $20 off. Download Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. All right, moving on to next year's lineup and what we know. Here's a couple things that I can feel I feel very comfortable in saying is that KJ Lewis will start at the University of Arizona next year. He is going to be one of your starting wings. Jaden Bradley is going to start. He is going to be your starting point guard. Going into the Big 12 sheer, those are really, really nice pieces to have. Sure, you're, it's not like we're talking about how you have Mike Bibby and you know Miles Simon, but these are guys who are very tough. They are physical, and not only that, they fit into what the Big 12 is about. Big fan of both of those guys being starters next year, as are you, Jason Shear. Yeah. I mean, the only way, in my opinion, that Jaden doesn't start is if there's some elite point guard in the portal. Um, and I even mean, like, then I'm, even then I'm, I mean, like elite, you know, I, I, I will say this that I think Jaden got off to somewhat of a rocky start last season when he got comfortable. But I think the last, let's say, 12 games, I think he proved to the coaching staff he's an elite or able to play an elite basketball. Um, you know, I, I would expect if you ask me who's going to start between him and Boswell, I would say Bradley. Uh, you know, well, it, it, I mean, at that point, we have a real problem if that's well, no, I know, but I'm just saying, like, you, we, I think there's a lot of options in the portal, is what I'm saying. Like, let's say we go back to what Arizona wanted to do last year, which is have the Boswell Nemhard backcourt, right? Mm-hmm. Could they have a situation where they have a Bradley, an elite point guard? At the, you know what I mean? Like right. a two-point guard system. That That's what I'm saying. Either way, he has to start is my yes. point. He's not yes. coming back to come off the bench ever. I would agree with that. Uh, I do think K.J. Lewis starts. And, mm-hmm. and and if he doesn't start, he's playing 25 minutes off the bench, right. right? You're using him like they used Pella last year where he's on the bench, but he's still playing 25 minutes. Um, those are probably the only two. Uh, I think the rest of it – well. I think Crevis probably starts at the five. Yeah, I think Crevis starts at the five. So here's what we know. Here's I'm just going to go with what uh, this is just a guess on my part, but I think we're looking at a starting lineup right now. And because I do believe that the starting power forward is not currently on this roster. As yes. a matter of fact, I'd I, be stunned if it if it is. Unless I, I completely in, agree with that. 
Yeah. Unless Dylan Anderson becomes a freak of nature. Um, we'll get to Dylan though. KJ Lewis, uh, 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 saying on, and Jaden Bradley, I think, are probably your leaders in the clubhouse to be your starting perimeter. I think you're looking at Mount Crevis up front, and you have got to get a good big or a good athletic, strong power forward. Kind of a Keyshaw Johnson, to be honest with you. Maybe a little bit different, but kind of that. You need to get an athletic, let's just say it, an athletic freak. You got to get somebody like that because... Listen, as much as we like Mount Crevis, I like Mount Crevis a lot. As much as I like Dylan Anderson, nobody likes Dylan Anderson more than me. These are not next level athletes. These are not these. You need to get an athlete here. It's it's going to be an elite athletic forward. You're not going to get like people. Uh, Brandon Angel was mentioned when he went in the portal. That's not the type of power forward Arizona wants. He's right. going to be athletic. He's going to be similar to Keyshawn. Ideally, he's a little bit better of a scorer than Keyshawn, but that's the guy that they want. Can right. guard multiple positions is athletic. You can't have an unathletic team in the Big 12. Uh, if I had to pick a freshman to start, it would be Sanan. Now, I will say that. Sanan. Sanan? Uh, no, Sanan. Just so Sanan, according to him. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he would probably be the freshman that I would expect to start. But I will say this if you can go and get a PJ Haggerty out of the portal, you go and do that, and Sane is coming off the bench. Mm -hmm. so I, 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 think realize, I, I think people got to realize, like, there's dudes in the portal where if Arizona can land them, it's going to change things around a little bit. All right, let's talk about Carter Bryant. I get a lot of people that ask about Carter Bryant, and rightfully so. He's very, very talented. Here's where I'm at with Carter Bryant. And again, he's very talented. He is going to make a very, very nice living one day in the NBA. Carter Bryant at the four is just not ready at the Big 12 level, in my opinion. In my opinion, Carter Bryant is a two-year player. I've always felt that he's a two-year player, and there is nothing wrong with that. I'll get people that will be like, man, why are you dissing him? Well, I still think he's a first-round pick. I just think it's going to take a little time. Here's the deal. When you look in the Big 12, these are grown men. These are 22, 23-year-old dudes. Everybody looks like Keyshawn Johnson or is even bigger. Carter is going to definitely have a role next year, but it's not going to be 28 minutes per game bouncing back and forth from the four to the three. So it's not going to happen. Yeah. I mean, Carter, Carter is good, obviously, you know, I don't think anyone's denying that, but yeah, like you mentioned, like there's some really, there's some freaks at the four in there. Right? Like, there's some tough dudes. Uh, I think Carter is going to have similar to a KJ Lewis role. Mm -hmm. where, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah where he'll come off the bench and some games he'll play 10 minutes and some games he'll play really well. And before you know it, he's playing 20 and he's a spark off the bench and he could guard multiple positions. And then next year, the year for that, he's ready to start and play 30 minutes a game. That's that's kind of how I see this playing out. Uh, not many people out there have watched Carter as much as we have, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think Carter has some things to figure out in terms of consistently being able to dominate. We've he's got to get games. stronger. I mean, you watch it. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with this. This is no. also this is also kind of just how things are, you know, biologically. When you look at Carter, this is one of Carter's things that I think is going to be best for him going forward is that Carter is young. You can tell by looking at him. I'm not talking age-wise, but you can tell from a development factor. He's not one of these dudes coming in here like Stanley Johnson that's basically going to be the same now as he is in four years. Carter is going to be a guy who is this, who is going to be you know, it's going to take him a year, but man, I think by the time he goes into that sophomore year, we're very much in that KJ Lewis realm where it's like, man, bring this. Cause this kid's going to be ready. I think people also have to remember, and we've brought this up and Calipari brought this up. I always go back to what he said after Kentucky lost college basketball is different. There's still the COVID year. It's still out there. Mm -hmm. So Carter Bryant's going in and he's being asked to guard 23 year old power forwards. Right. right. It's just, it's, it's a different game. That's one of the reasons why these younger teams are struggling. You look at the final four now, these dudes are transfers. These guys are older, physical, because that young stuff doesn't really work anymore. Right. It doesn't work. And the COVID year is still something that I think John Calipari makes a very good point on. And so there is that. But again, I think when you're looking at players off the bench, Carter Bryant's going to play. It's going to be like a KJ Lewis. As a matter of fact, here, listen, you, there's no bigger fan of KJ Lewis, obviously, than me. I thought KJ should have, I think you could have made the case that KJ probably could have played a little bit more. He obviously, he obviously did it, but you know, and Mulebach said this, and I don't think I'm, he said that here's the thing about Lloyd. And I think some people can get a little bit frustrated by Lloyd. Listen, 
I always preface this by saying that I hope Tommy Lloyd is here for the next 500 years. So, but you know, I think there are some things that you look at and I think he's kind of gets caught in the moment with just going with whoever's out there, but you know, I think in hindsight, KJ probably should have played a little bit more, but at the same time, I think he's also going to take inventory of this year's team and realize that, you know, that's something that should have happened. Now let's talk about Umar Ballo, leader of men, Umar Ballo, leader of men, um, became way better than I ever thought he was going to be. Not only did he become way better than I thought he was ever going to be, um, you know, he became, he, he was a good basketball player, but I will say that if you're looking at one more year of Umar Ballo, leader of men, or say two or three years of Crevis and Dylan Anderson, I'm going to take two to three years of Crevis and Dylan Anderson, mainly because with Crevis, I think, Cre listen, Umar Ballo is what he is, and that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing, but he's always going to be what he is right now. With Crevis, you're this is a guy that I think he's got more natural basketball skills. I think that's fair to say, is it not? You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and look, the, the coaching staff loves Crevis. They love him. I'm just going to say that people can criticize he's stiff, whatever, um, which I don't necessarily agree with. I'm telling you right now, they think he is going to be a stud in two years, like yeah. really, really good, and they don't want to lose him. And if he went to the coaching staff, he said, in the coaching staff, he doesn't, he's not going to the coaching staff. The coaching staff is smart enough to be like, look, we love Umar. If we brought him to the Big 12, he'd be awesome. But Crevis would be gone. Dylan would be gone. We wouldn't be able to add a transfer center. Like, our, our options would be very limited. I, I say this with multiple players. I, I say this with at least one guy a year, right? It's time to move on. Like, eventually, it's just time. See, I don't know on. if I buy that. I agree with you here. But I don't know why is it time to move on. I'm not. Okay, so you, think, you think Pella should come back? Um, I don't want Pella. I mean, you think Caleb Love should come back? Um, I win. <laughs> That's what I mean by it's time. Like it's just time already. You're 24 years old, right? Fire, fair, 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 fair enough, fair enough. Um, now let's look at now. One thing we I feel like we have to do this disclaimer every single show, and we will continue to do this disclaimer. Emmanuel Steven is not playing big minutes next year. And again, there is nothing wrong with that. He is not playing big minutes next year. I keep there is a guy on Twitter that will send me dunk highlights from Emmanuel Steven at least twice a week at least twice a week. And every single time he said, you mean to tell me that this guy couldn't contribute next year? Yes. Again, I have seen him quite a bit. Uh, number one, he's still, and, and yes, he's probably bigger than Coloco was, but he's still skinny. He's like 210 pounds. Uh, right. There's nothing. How many true freshman centers contribute at a high level right away? Very few. Just think, Very of, the, few. Just think right. of the U of A. Just think of the U of A, DeAndre Ayton. And again, he's not DeAndre Ayton. Dude, Aaron Bradshaw was a five-star center. He averaged five points and three rebounds this year. Yes, exactly. Oh, right. Zach Eady. Did, hey, let me ask you this. If Zach Eady wanted to come to the U of A, would they say we can probably make room for him? I'm going to go ahead and say yes. All right. So, again, we don't. We never say never. We never say never. Okay. Kylan Boswell, that's the next one that we need to discuss. Um, listen, here's where I'm at with Kylan Boswell. If he wants to come back and be a backup, cool. I'm in. If he wants to come back and start, no, I'm not. Um, that's really where that's really where it comes to for me. I mean, nope. No, no, you know, again, he if he wants to come back and be the backup point guard, totally cool with that. But I cannot go into another season with Kylan as my starter. Here's here's what's really kind of amazing when you think about it is that and yeah, Boswell in a Ky Justin Kyer role, I'm fine with that. If he wants to do that, I don't think he's going to do that, but <laughs> If he wants to do that, totally cool. But I'm also kind of at the stage, though, with uh, with Boswell that Arizona's now had three years of, let's be honest here, bad starting point guard play. That's that's the best way you could put it. Kirk Carissa, you were never going to go far with as your starting point guard. Kylan Boswell, not going to be that dude either. You've got, you can't go into next season with that as your status quo. Yeah, I just, it's real. Again, like I keep drawing the comparisons. The Boswell situation is the curse situation. You want to come back and play 15 minutes a game off the bench? You're not going to start? Hey, man, we'll welcome you. You screw up, though. You're out, right? right. Or you go somewhere else. You're not starting. That Those days are gone. Right. And I think if he comes back also, there should be there, – there, there will be. I'm actually confident that there will be strict parameters 
on some of the stuff that he's doing off the court. I don't think that you can bring him back and let that stuff continue. And that, and again, that to me is kind of the greater thing. That's one of the few things that, you know, I really look at with Tommy. And I think that, I think it's fair to say that that's going to be something that uh, Tommy's just got to hold the guy. Listen, Tommy's Tommy Lloyd's a great dude. I mean, Tommy Lloyd is a awesome good dude. Of a dude. <laughs> yeah, but I think you could make the case that he's almost too good of a dude yeah. in that he doesn't want, I think, you know what it is here? I think it's, I, I don't, I think he kind of avoids confrontation, not avoids that because that makes him sound like a total weenie, but he's not looking to, let's, let's just call a spade a spade. When Colin Boswell sat down and started gambling at that blackjack table, he should have been benched to start the next game, period. None of the, we need to love on Kylan and all of that. He should have been benched. And I haven't talked with one person behind the scene that doesn't agree with that. That's just the way well, it is. I agree completely. I, and, I completely agree. And I also think it shows a little bit that, you know, the team, there's a lot of guys on the team that don't really worry about it because it's like, well, I can do anything. The best thing, the biggest thing that a coach has going for them at their disposal is being able to bench a player if they don't do what they're supposed to do. That wasn't, yeah. ever, that wasn't ever utilized. And um, I think also like the days of really fighting to keep players is kind of over. Like, what I mean is if Kylan went to the coaching staff, he's like, I'm transferring. I, I think a part of the coaching staff's mind with really any player on the roster, except maybe like KJ Lewis even, yeah. is look, and the we're at the time where as fast as you leave Arizona, that's how fast we can replace you. Yeah. And and Tommy's <laughs> also shown that too. Tommy's yeah. shown that that you know, for the longest time, people were worried about the domestic recruiting. Is it good enough? Is he gonna be able to uh, you know, it's clearly good enough. You look at, uh, you know, you look at the four guys he's going to be bringing in this year. These are all four. These are four top 100 kids. Um, one thing that we do need to take with a grain of salt, and I think it's very fair to say going forward, and I think it's very fair to say about pretty much anything, is that anytime we're talking about an international player from here on out, we have no expectations. Not saying they're going to be good, not saying they're going to be bad. We have no expectations because – we're batting a what an O for five or an O for seven. I mean, I guess we can count. Well, Crevis is a hit. Crevis is a hit. Is a hit. Crevis is a hit. Cool. Great. But Adama Ball, nope. Uh, Philly B, nope. Uh, Paulius Morauskas, nope. Uh, I hate to say uh, Henry Vasar so far, nope. Um, Conrad Martinez, likely nope. I mean, these are kind of raw. These have outside of uh, uh, Crevis, these have kind of been roster filler. Yeah, I don't disagree. But yeah. international recruiting is very hard. I got it up into a point. Uh, I think if you see a guy that you think is a stud, you could go get him. But I think the days of uh, real like relying on it, I think those days are gone. Yeah, and I'm honestly, I'm also at the point too where I'm okay bringing in one per class. I can't bring in three per class because the hit rate just isn't there. Um, now, listen, if you, I and we're also, I think, at the point two in the Big 12. And here's where the Pac-12 was also a little bit of a kind of a fool's gold. You can get away with having three or four non-contributors because you're in the Pac-12. You're going to win it no matter what. You can't go into a season or you can't go into the Big 12 having four guys who you can't really put out there on the court. I, a great of debt scholarships is gone. You just can't do it. You, yeah. Again, you get away with it when you're at Gonzaga. You can get away with it in the Pac-12. You can't get away with it in the Big 12. You just can't. Right. And that's just the way it is. Um, is. Let's see here. Jay, are this another weird thing about uh, – the thing with Boswell, too, that I think is kind of surprising is he's just kind of limited. Um, He can't really – doesn't really get to the hoop. I think – Jump what, shooter. What's that? He's, he's a, a jump, jump shooter. shooter. And you've had three straight years of point guards that can't get to the hoop. That's why it was wild watching Jaden Bradley come in. And you're like, dude, this guy, Jaden Bradley, I think shot as many free throws in the last two games of Arizona season as I think Boswell shot maybe the whole year. I mean, I don't think I'm really that far off. No, I'm going to look that up. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Sheer, I am a big, uh, I am, uh, Jaden Bradley is a big win for me though. This is correct. This is correct. Yeah. Kylan Boswell had... 39 free throw attempts the entire season. Okay. Jaden Bradley had 28 free throw. No, 80 okay. free throw attempts. So, 80. So he shot in less time, he shot double the amount of free throws. Uh, Not only that, I think By he the way, might have shot more in the NCAA. He had 
19 in the NCAA tournament. All right, here, uh, Hoop Dreams. This is a, this is a question you, you hear. He says, I find it hard to believe that Vasar just forgot how to play basketball. When have we, I, I don't mean this in a negative light. When have we seen that he does know how to play basketball? I don't understand. And that's not what we're saying. There's yeah. so much. He's skilled. No, neither of us are saying he's not skilled. There's a lot more that goes into that. We see some very skilled players do nothing in college. Right. There's yeah. guys that are skilled at your local park, but they can't play because they're not physical enough, because they can't guard, because they can't pat. Like, there's reasons why certain guys can't do certain things. He could very well be good next year. Tommy thinks he will be. Yeah, and again, Tommy's not bringing him back. And here's the cool thing about the way things are now. If he comes back and he's not good enough, guess what? Oh, Vasar can't drive a golf cart. That is, oh, oh that, uh, no, that was not, Va that wasn't Vasar driving the golf cart. No, that's Philly B. Man, but you know, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Um, All right, but. That's where that's where it's going to kind of be with this team going forward, and it's going to be fascinating to see how this really how this really does unfold because you essentially have two you have you have three or four guys that you actually know. Let's let's count the guys that we know are going to have a very significant role. Oh, by the way, would Arizona take KJ Simpson? I think he's declaring. You think he's going to the draft? Yeah. <laughs> All right, Henry was good two years ago at Red Blue. Well. So is so is Sadiki Johnson. Ah, you beat me to it. Oh, guess what? We got a super snap coming in. The super snap. All right. Development comes in practice, of course. But if the guys are getting little to no run, how do you truly evaluate that? That's practice. This isn't football. Like it just it, it in football does the same thing. You evaluate in practice. That's when you evaluate. I was talking with uh, somebody from Fox Sports the other day who made a really good point about uh, Arizona is going to be a very attractive destination for. Uh, for transfer portal players. And a big reason why is Keyshaw Johnson. What, uh, listen, I don't know that Keyshaw Johnson's playing in the NBA, but what to the Tommy Gunn said about Keyshaw Johnson is he was going to give him an opportunity to come to the U of A and he was going to let him show three, po a three point prowess that he wasn't allowed to show at San Diego State. Tommy Gunn was a man of his word. Keyshaw Johnson made significantly more three pointers in one year at Arizona than he did it for at San Diego state. That's going to be a good recruiting tool skier. Yeah. I mean, it's real simple. If you're a player that wants to show off your offensive skills, uh, he, Tommy's the guy, right? Right. That's just it. Tommy will. And, and Keyshawn has said like, look, you know, it just, it, that's not what I was asked to do at San right. Diego state at Arizona. Tommy says, shoot the ball. And so I, I shot the ball and they worked on it with me and if you're an athletic four man who's got some offense in his game, but it's playing for a team that wants to be in the 60s and you want to show off your skills and you're good enough to do everything else, Arizona's going to be, be the place. I, I'm actually, I am very, very curious to see what four man that Arizona lands. But we are giving you the template of what it's going to be. It yeah. is not. It is not going to be an athletic stiff. We can 1,000% uh, agree on this. Um, no, I do not believe that Arizona, and this is a fair question, I don't believe Arizona is going to go after Victorious Miller. They didn't really go no. after him to begin with, so I would be very surprised if they went after him. Uh, competitive. I don't, think he's any, I don't think he's any different than Jamari in a way, right? I would rather have Jamari Phillips. I already got a better version of him. I already take Jamari Phillips. Now, let's talk Jamari Phillips for a second. This is going to be... You got to you got to remember here with uh, Jamari. I'm a big fan of Jamari's game. I think that he could score at all three levels. He hasn't played a ton this last you know this last year or so. He played a little bit, but hadn't played a ton in uh, high school. So it's going to be a. I would just say you know it's it it might take a little bit of time there. Just but uh, you know he's one of those players just like anybody else. I think the sooner he can get on campus, the better. Uh, kind of get in that structure. But again, it's difficult if you haven't played a ton of high school ball in the last year, Cheryl. I'll just say the way it is. Yeah, for sure. Like Jamari. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, again, it, it goes back to you are a freshman, you are a scorer. He's very talented. He's but, very talented. Uh, on and off, you know, it, it, and it's hard to, yeah, and he could surprise, but you got to get in there. There's high school shape and then there's college shape. There's the ability to score in high school, and then there's the ability to score in college, and things change. And he could be good, but like all freshmen, really, it's it's be patient. He's a, he's the one though that I think he's got to be able. Like I said, and I say this about a lot of players, I think that the sooner you can get on campus, the better. 
the more that you can, the sooner you can get, because at college is just a totally different college is just a totally different environment all the way around than, uh, than anything else. Now, one thing that isn't, uh, one thing, uh, you know, one of the great underrated things about college life, Jason Shear, what Mike illegal Pete's these kids hang out at illegal Pete's now, Illegal Pete's, Ben Bolch, this isn't what you think it is. Illegal Pete's <laughs> is here to bring you a win with the legendary sound check deal. Bring in your ticket stub from bring in your ticket stub from any ticketed event. And uh, let's see, and get a draft beer or house margarita for a penny. Illegal Pete's wants to celebrate with you, whether it's a pregame or a postgame party. They got you covered on all your game day needs. Must purchase an adult entree to re uh, redeem Illegal Pete's sound check deal. Illegal Pete's, your go to spot for burritos, buddies, and beer. Also, Gila River Resorts and Casinos. Gila River Resorts and Casinos. Sheer, I have seen Gila River Resorts and Casinos from uh, I-10. There's a reason that it's featured prominently. You got the cool little blue wave. It looks very, very good. Sheer, you've seen this as well, I assume. I see it all the time. It is an attractive place. Dude, it, is. it looks absolutely amazing. Gila River Resorts and Casinos. You do you at Gila River Resorts and Casinos. Visit play at Gila.com for more details. Who has a better chance of getting playing time, Mike or Conrad? Um, about the same. Um, oh, come on. Oh, you think, Dude, I, have a, you think I have a better Conrad chance? Stay. You better hope Conrad doesn't stay because that Philly B bet, that's trouble. If they both leave, it's a wash, right? No, I win. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. I win. If he leaves Sheer, you lost that bet. Come on. That That's not – and no, I don't want Eddie – no, I don't want Eddie Lampkin. All right. Uh, I want to make fun of uh, something that a lot of people have uh, been uh, asking me about uh, with the ASU folks. Uh, Toe Tree, really good dude, took a shot at Shear the other day, which made me very, very, uh, which made me very. Uh, yes, uh, Jake, we're going to get to that at the end because that deserves an, its entire segment. Um, but everybody's like, oh, the ASU folks, they talk about Arizona so much. Here's what you do when you have nothing that you can really talk about with your own product. And I would do the exact same thing. I would want to talk about a product, something else like that. Wow. I was talking about this with the great Jacob Franklin behind the scenes. Joking aside, let's be very serious here. How many minutes would Philly B get at ASU next year? 20. 20. I agree. Yeah. Well, Paulius about the same and Paulius yeah. would be in Paulius might cont uh, contend for a starting position. Absolutely. You know, uh, let's see uh, who, who else Conrad Martinez. Would he play? I mean, maybe a backup point. Uh, yeah. But either way, I'll I'll play worse this season. Yeah. Bobby play worse. I mean, yeah, we, we could, we, you could definitely do a lot worse. So I think both of those guys would play. Uh, I think both of those guys, well, certainly Polly, I almost said uh, Folly B, Philly B and uh, Polly M would both play significant minutes. And honestly, here's what I hope they do. I hope they go to Grand Canyon. I, I would assume they're going to go to like St. Mary's or Santa Clara or something like that. Why not Grand Canyon? That'd be, hey, I'm all for it. Dude, and Grand Canyon, that's where I, I hope they end up at Grand Canyon. They would, um, does Tommy get Frankie Collins as a backup? If Frankie Collins wanted to come here as a backup, we would take Frankie Collins as a backup, correct? Yeah, but he's not. I, I think the only thing I know about him is he visited or he had a meeting with TCU the other day. Yeah, and uh, Conrad like is way better than PJC. I don't think so. No, um, <laughs> I, listen, PJC got beat up a lot. Um but PJC is that PJC was better than Arizona's starting point guard the last three seasons. You want to know why? Because he would bring the ball up the court. He wouldn't do much, but he wouldn't turn it over and he wouldn't act like a turd. Yeah. He's killing it in Europe. By the way. I know. Isn't that, that is really cool to see. All right. I need to talk a little bit about, uh, cause uh, Jake, but, um, Heath Bray. Now I always give Sheer a lot of, uh, Sheer a lot of grief, but he knows this one as well. Sheer came, Sheer really became a U of A guy in 01. Um, fair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When I came to school, Heath Bray was the epitome, and um, he p passed away. Obviously, Heath uh, Heath Bray was the epitome of a wildcat. You never looked up Heath Bray's numbers, and you were going to be blown away by him. But here's the one thing about Heath Bray: is that you everybody respects respected Heath Bray. Offensive side of the football, defensive side of the football. I mean, Dwayne Aquino when he was here as an offensive coordinator back in the day. Um, 
Heath Bray was just a dude that everybody got, everybody liked. And that's the best thing that you can really say about him is that you never really found anybody that disliked Heath Bray here. And this was a just a good dude and just a, a really good ambassador for Arizona football and an awesome dude as well. Yeah, you know, it, I, I think a lot of times you could judge a man by the people around him, right? And what they say yeah. and, and certain things. And uh, when he passed, you could just tell. Uh, I mean, Brandon Sanders, heartbroken. Uh, players, heartbroken. Just regular old people. Erica Barnes. Like, everyone who ever met him was was crushed. And um, it's a sad day, you know, and, and young, right? We know Jake. Jake's a great dude. Jake's a great kid. Um, just just crushing, right? And And it's something where, you know, you start kind of reflecting, and it's like, man, like, you're right. Like, that... Those are the, I, I say this jokingly a lot, um, but seriously a lot as well. It's like, that's what, that's everything about college sports that you enjoy and that you love. And, and that's kind of what Heath Bray was. Yeah. So again, a, a, a big tip of the cap and condolences to the Bray family, because obviously they did a, uh, they did a fantastic job there. And Jake, we're thinking about you, my guy. Um, all right. <laughs> this is an interesting question that was asked. He said, uh, uh, can we get a point guard? Can we get a freshman that can come in like Mike Bibby? No, there are no freshmen like that. Mike Bibby is the best player I've ever seen at the University of Arizona. Yeah, as much as I would love to say you could get a Mike Bibby, there are no Mike Bibbies out there. Those are unicorns. They do not. But if the unicorn does ha happen on campus, we will take it. Times have changed, man. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm looking at, like I, I want to look this out real quick. So like player rankings from last year's class, right? Mm hmm you take a look at the, the 2023 class, okay? You take a look at the point guard rankings, right, Mike? Mm -hmm. The number one point guard in the class was Isaiah Collier, who was solid. Right. Elliot Cadeau, who was solid. But then after that, it was just, I mean, Dillingham came out, was good. He came out the bench. Shellstad, like, they're good, right? right? But they're not, holy crap, this dude just took over the game, right? right like, they're right. not like that. Right. So that uh, that was very uh, that was very very cool. Um, Collier was uh, yeah. Collier didn't do a ton for me. I told I you, that I won I, that one. Sheer, you know what? I generally like ignoring my L's and uh, just basically focusing on my W's. I am not under any circumstances ever chalking Cody Williams up to an L. But I will give Isaiah Collier. I thought Isaiah Collier was going to come in, and I thought he was going to be significantly better than he was. Sheer, you win that one. Sheer, flex your muscle. Show the people out there why you are Jason Sheer. A lot of times, if you're not a big-time scorer in high school, you just won't be a big-time scorer in college. And, and right. he's just not that good of an offensive player. Right. I mean, he would. and here's the thing is, he'll probably be, he'll, he'll probably be a starting NBA point guard. You want to know why? He is, but he's not going to be a huge difference maker. And that's what you draft. When your kid comes in as a top five player there, you can at least look down the road and say, they're probably going to be a huge difference maker. Now, again, our Cody Williams talk, you can see that Cody Williams is about 2% of the basketball player that he's going to be. This is true. Sheer. We'll find out. Oh, we'll, find out. <laughs> we'll say this. How about this? If he goes to the NBA this year, He's making a mistake. He should take the path that his brother took. Right. I would agree with that. And on top of that, too, when you already have generational money, I don't just I just don't see what the uh, the hurry is. Um, you know, again, his brother is going to be making a max deal here. But I will tell people this that are trying to give me garbage. One guy said, oh, well, you know, he'll never be as good. His brother averaged seven points per game at Santa Clara as a freshman. Yeah. So you his brother took a four year route or whatever it was and, and got really good. He, he was same deal. You Cody should it. not go to the NBA. All right. Now, uh, by the way, um, uh, Jacob Franklin, if you could pull up the PHNX BTFD shirts, we have a true story about this. So we're all getting dinner with the goat, Brian Jeffries. What has that guy ever done? And a guy in a BTFD shirt came up asking to take a, <laughs> asking to take a picture with me. Had no clue who Brian Jeffries was. It was the funniest thing. And Shear was right there to watch it. It was awesome. He only knew who you were. He didn't know who I was, Ben. It was just you. And Brian Jeffries was probably like, well, you know what? I get asked for uh, pictures all the time. I'll gladly sit this one out. Okay, here's the deal. Shear was playing Hurt today, or Shear's family was playing Hurt. Shear, we very much appreciate you coming on. You will be back with us Wednesday, though. This is correct. 
Uh, yeah, I'll be there. Well, all right. Yes, in the right. morning. Yes, you will. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Yeah. On that note, though, let's see here. Did we get all of our reads in? Let's see. Yep, we did. We did. We did. All right. On that note, though, we're signing off. We're going to have all kinds of portal names for you on Wednesday. The thing we do here is we don't conjecture. We like to report, check. <laughs> Then check, then recheck the facts again, my friends. You know, when you come on here, you, all you get is serious talk. But on that note, for Jason Shear, I am merely Mike Luke, the great Jacob Franklin slithering around behind the scenes. You guys have been listening to the AZ Wildcats podcast. We all silly like the mayor. 